Good morning, Grace Church. Let's stand to our feet and worship God together. Are you ready to have church this morning? Come on, put those hands together. Come on. They said unto me, let us go to the house, go to the house of the Lord, right? All I want, and all that I need is here in the house, here in the house of the Lord, right? Let's have church. Let's join the heavenly sound. There's nothing like your presence when the praise breaks out.
generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name
Hallelujah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Well, it is so good to worship with you in the house of the Lord this morning. We're gonna take the next few minutes, just greet those around you. Maybe stretch across the aisle a little further than you typically would. And if you're joining us online, we are so glad you are here with us today. Why don't you drop us a line in the chat? Let us know where you're joining us from this morning. All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Tell you what, we could do that for a little bit longer. So appreciate our team and just the ability to praise the Lord together. You know, it's one of the great things of coming together as a church family. There's just something about together lifting up our praises to the Lord no matter what's happening and blessing the name of the Lord. I tell you, he says that the, the presence of the Lord, you know, comes and rests on the praises of his people. There's really truth to that. Hey, if you will, pull out your bulletins. I want to highlight a couple things. As you're doing that, anybody that's newer around here, we're glad you're here. Welcome. All kinds of ways to connect with us. We have things happening about seven days a week. You can see in the bulletin or online. But also there's a connect card right here in front of you up in the, the balcony as well or online. You'll see there are easy ways to interact with us with questions, maybe a prayer request, ways that we can help, come alongside you, pray for, for you, encourage you. Or maybe you just have a question about Jesus, the Bible, why we do what we do. We'd love to interact with you about any of those things. And then those of you that come ready to give your tithes or offerings, we do that at the end of the service on your way out. You'll see ways to give uh, around all of the exits in, in, in the offering boxes. Or, of course, electronically, you can see there ways to do that. If you, if you will, just open it up to the first page here. I just want to give a plug for our, our Sunday school classes we have so many things that are happening from Sunday school to our midweek service, prayer services, but really our Sunday school classes come a little bit earlier, nine o'clock, because our conviction is to be a church that knows the Bible. And the, the content that we are producing in our Sunday school is just, it's off the chart. It is so solid and so good. I can't recommend enough that you come. All ages start at nine o'clock, so little kids, teens, we have Sunday school for everyone, um, and also they're online, and so if you, you didn't make it, you, their notes are online, the audio is online, and then this Wednesday specifically, we have a, a guest that's going to be with us, Cal Rickner. Actually, the last couple days, we had 100 people that went through, uh, we do this a couple times a year, our Get Free seminar where we're, you know, Cal says you get saved, but then you still have all this stuff to deal with. We had 100 people over the last couple days go through this because we are committed to see people get freed from entangling areas of sin that keep us bogged down. So praise God for that. Cal's staying over for a few days, and he's going to be with us on Wednesday night. We do that in our atrium, atrium chapel. You don't want to. You don't want to miss that. What do you think about Cal, man? When he man, comes, he's a workhorse. So you he? you realize, guys, that Cal has a church in uh, Peoria that probably reaches an entire region. I mean, we. I was listening to him years ago and, and just dreaming about the day that he'd be able to, you know, help us and interface with us. And so this is such a God thing that he's partnering with us. Yeah. And he comes in and works hard and just strengthens Absolutely. our church. Setting captives for a year. That's right. And building the team. All right, we got a lot to cover. Yeah, uh, last couple days have been intense. Man, last yesterday. night on the way to church, it was like, what in the world's happening in Israel? But it turns out that like 1% even landed? Is that what they're that, saying? Yeah. That's amazing. So for those of you that don't know, you know, Iran sent over 100 suicide uh, drones and drones, missiles. missiles. I mean, Saudi Arabia got involved. Jordan got involved, not against Israel, but against for them. Israel with the United States, Great Britain, others of shooting amazing. these things down before they even got into Israel. That's, that is. That's, 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 that's a God huge. thing. It is a God thing. And so we just need to continue to pray, ask the Lord's hand to be upon the nation and that there would be a supernatural intervention because right. it's a mess. So another thing, you know, Eva was at Snooks the other day or yesterday and said there were like five different people trying to get her to sign a petition 
and it's very deceptive. It's a petition to get abortion back on the Missouri ballot. Right. And it looks like they might have done it. It's, there's more than likely. Don't sign it. Decline to sign was the videos that we watched over the last yeah. couple of days. But also, you were telling me that when we're going to put this on our resource page, because it, it's compelling. You know, even Amanda and I, we were in a shopping uh, the Aldi, the new Aldi here on Dorset, and some of the things that they're saying, you're like, well, yeah, I'll, right. I'll get behind that. But then some of the petitioners are not disclosing all of what we're signing. And you said there's a, a place we can go. Yeah, so our team, our, our, our uh, civic engagement team has come up with a way that you can get your name off the ballot, if, or off of it. Off if the you petition. Did. Yeah. Off the petition. So, so we're gonna put that link on our resources page. If that's you and that applies, you can do that if you'd like to. All right, so we're watching huge changes to our way of life right now. And uh, some of the most extreme are happening to our kids. And before we get back to the Sermon on the Mount today, I want us to watch three real short videos that shine light on the damage that's being done. Let's watch the first one here. When Jamie Reed worked as a caseworker at the Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital, she thought she was saving trans kids' lives. But she claims what she witnessed there was so morally and medically appalling that she had no choice but to expose what was really going on. I was working in a pediatric gender center for four and a half years, primarily responsible for patient intakes. The center followed this message that transition would solve everything, that it would solve a child's mental health problems. There were very few written protocols or guidelines. One of the providers even said we were flying the plane as we built it. Doctors are acting like they're God when it comes to medically transitioning children. Children could identify themselves as transgender, see a therapist for one visit, see our endocrinologist for one visit, and end up with hormones that would impact and change their bodies for their lifetime. These were identities that were still shifting and changing, but the treatments were irreversible and permanent. I saw a young person who was begging to have their breasts put back on after having surgery. We were encouraged not to make a big deal out of it and definitely not to tell other families. I couldn't continue to be silent on it. The medical harms and trauma that I saw with these teens just took over my life. I was told I could no longer raise concerns or even use the phrase, I have concerns about a patient. I have no trust in this industry medically transitioning minors anymore. You know, she, she identifies as le a lesbian married to a trans man, and yet God <laughs> uses her to expose this horrible thing that's happening. Uh, thank God for Dr. Phil, man. Dr. Phil is He's being bold. He's waking up. He's being wow. politically incorrect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, some of this, when we see this, we say, thank God for whistleblowers. And it's the way we can pray because we want to see more and more whistleblowers that, that aren't afraid and to be bold and to speak up. We need more of that because, again, this is about kids. And we're saying, hey, kids at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old shouldn't be able to make these lifelong decisions. So let's get it. Irreversible. Into Irreversible. And so anyways, I want to, you know, applaud her as a whistleblower, and then let's pray for more. And because of this, just so you know, just how this affected us, because this was here in St. Louis, uh, back in August here in Missouri, we passed a law that outlaws puberty blockers, hormones, and gender-affirming surgery for minors. We're one of 19 states that have done so. She was things. part of that, you know. Sure. Now again, because some people hear that, but, but listen, some people hear that and they think that's hateful. It's actually not hateful. No. We want to say, hey, wait a second. This is an unprecedented area of medical intervention that's never been done for before. We should push pause before we go and do surgeries to kids or hormone blockers that we don't know how it's going to affect them long term. Um, this, no, we can applaud for that. That's okay to applaud. We just got to do it in the right spirit. This week, Andrew, ba Andrew Bailey, our Missouri Attorney General, he said this as he continues to, to fight along this line. He says, the court just ordered Planned Parenthood St. Louis to turn over documents exposing how they subjected children to puberty blockers and irreversible surgery, often without parental consent. 
We are three for three in our court battle to force clinics to comply with our investigations. More of these types of investigations need to happen. Again, if there's nothing to hide, then we should have open public investigations into some of these organizations. Here's another organization. This one is called, the, listen to this title, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH. This is the leading medical authority, a global authority that leads all kinds of medical associations as it relates to, this, uh, to the approach of transgenderism. Leaked files from this organization, WPATH, clearly reveal that many kids and their parents don't understand the effects of what they're even signing up for. And WPATH and the organizations that support it know it. They know it. And yet, they continue to be the global authority speaking into this issue. It, that's, that's just, it's, it's unthinkable. This has led, actually, to... Uh, England being uh, an another country in the, in the European Union to ban transgender surgeries and puberty blockers to minors. So the good news is that this stuff is being exposed. That's the, the good stuff. You know, even in my neighbor, I was telling the church last night, you know, this, because we think of this as like out there. But I, even last summer, I remember one of our neighbors moved out of the state of Missouri because of the legislation that I just spoke of in Missouri because they were transgendering their eight-year-old boy to become a girl. And their, you know, their statement was that they wanted to get out of a state that was not safe for their child. So guys, we, we have to be able to build it's relational right bridges. right here, yeah, the, the point was it's right here. It's, it's right here, but also we gotta have a fire underneath us and we can't just go out and shout. We have to build relational bridges to speak truth in reason and love to appeal to people because the, the, the way that this is being promoted, you know, from media, from pop stars and politics is that the loving thing to do is to let a kid be completely modified in their hormones in their body. They can't get a tattoo, but they can get their sex. Right, tattoo. and we're saying, all we're saying is hold up a second. Let's actually think this through with some rational thought. Guys, we can't be afraid to have those kinds of conversations with the right spirit, but we got to have those kinds of conversations. Okay, so why have so many kids suddenly decided they're transgender? In her book, Irreversible Damage, Abigail Schreier calls it social contagion. I think she nailed it. Uh, something that's become very popular among teenage girls in particular. And now after reading Jonathan Haidt's book, new book this past week, I mean, the, it's called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. I am convinced this guy has nailed the cause. I mean, he has found it. Uh, he's not a Christian, he's a social psychologist who digs into the numbers. I mean, he, he's analyzing the numbers of what is driving this epidemic and what opened Pandora's box and uh, we're just gonna hear, you know, he's, he's promoting his book right now, so you're gonna see him on a couple of different interviews. Let's watch this. First, we have to establish the numbers here, which are stunning. The latest data from Gallup is around nine hours a day is what they spend on their phones and screens. Five hours a day of that is social media. Another three to five is all the other stuff that they do. So imagine if your child, if you take nine or 10 hours out of their day, every single day, where's it gonna come from? They spend less time sleeping, less time with other kids, less time outside, less time exercising, a lot more time just being sedentary and solitary. So for all those reasons, oh, nobody, very little reading of books, no hobbies, there's no time. There's no time for anything. So that's the first thing. It pushes out all the good things of childhood that we want our kids to have. When you give a kid a smartphone, it's likely to move to the center of her life, and that's what she's going to do for the rest of her life. And so... Um, so that's one of the main ways of harm. It just deprives you of everything else. Um, another thing it does is it fragments your attention. Uh, you and I uh, are probably, you know, we can pay attention to things, we can do our work, but it's harder now than it was 10 years ago. There's constant interruptions, but we're still able to do it, but it's a struggle. A teenager just starting puberty, age 10, 11, 12, the prefrontal cortex is, has not yet rewired for the adult configuration. They're not, real, they're not very good at paying attention. And early puberty is when that skill really develops. And so to have them trying to develop that skill 
while being interrupted every few minutes. Um, the average teen now gets, uh, one study found 257 notifications a day, 257 interruptions every day. It's very hard to focus on anything. So you get fragmented attention and we don't know how permanent this is. Um, another harm is addiction. The brain adapts to that constant level of stimulations that when you're not getting it, you're in a deficit mode, you're irritable, you're unhappy, uh, you feel terrible. So these devices are designed to grab hold of our kids' attention and never let go. And they're very effective at that. I could go on. There are so many other avenues of harm, but those are some of the big ones that I cover in the book. You make such an interesting point about how parents today, it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Too much hovering mm -hmm. in real life yeah. <laughs> where there is any left. <laughs> and then none with virtual. Mm -hmm. Go in your room, lock yourself in there with the portal of evil that is the phone. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. No, it's insane. Well, how did you explain yeah. that to yeah. me? Well, so, you know, so for one thing, we were freaked out by child abduction, all sorts of things, and, and you know, sexual predators uh, in, in previous decades. But guess what? They all moved on to Instagram. That's where they're hanging out because it makes it very easy for them to talk to young women, young men. Um, so the, the, the real world has actually gotten safer and safer. Right. The online world has actually gotten more and more dangerous. Most of us who remember the 90s, the internet was amazing. It was, we were all techno-optimists. This is gonna help democracy. This is gonna right. be the most amazing thing ever. And it doesn't really get kind of dark and nasty until the 2010s. And so we, that's why we missed the switch. We thought, well, okay, my kid is online all the time. My kid is texting with other kids. Maybe that's as good as playing with them, maybe. We didn't know back then, but we were wrong. It's not. Good night. Okay. Lord, help us. I'm reading this gonna book, a, and I'm talking to him going, you got to read this book. After church, we're having a cell phone burning party in the back <laughs> parking lot, so the teenagers I, they, they are not liking so this. I it. am not seeing happy faces over here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I mean, yeah. I, Lord, help us. We just have to, we, we, as parents, as grandparents, we just can't check out. We have to be involved. We have to at least be engaged. I don't know if we can separate from it. But we got to do something. We can't just let it be completely unregulated. Okay, I'm going to try to, you know, put this together just real quick. A bunch of you have come to this church because your church wasn't speaking out. All right, you've joined here. We we have new members dinners, our new breakfast members breakfast, and and we're meeting a bunch of you. And you were at high level positions, some of you, in your other church. You are on a battleship now. It is time to find your position and help us figure this out. Because when I'm reading his book, he's postulating all kinds of ideas, and I'm going, as I'm reading it, I'm going, no, nah, that ain't gonna work. That is not gonna work, that's not gonna work. Yeah, yeah, great idea, but that's not gonna work. And I'm thinking, you know, it's up to the church right now. We are going to have to figure this out. And, and we don't have a lot of people around us to help us. So you're on the battleship, help us get together, read this book, and start thinking through this grid. Because some of you have gifts and abilities to start thinking, okay, here's what we could do. We could, you know, start creating communities that, you know, of people that can, you know, their kids can hang out together, play together, especially younger children. I mean, he talks about play, unsupervised play, and how important that is to brain development. All right, so I'm gonna recommend three books. I mean, you've heard me talk about the two of them at least. Uh, Hate's new book, uh, Anxious Generation, I really think you ought to read that. Abigail Schreier books, uh, uh, Schreier's book, uh, Bad Therapy. Now, you know, uh, the first one was uh, irreversible. irreversible damage, but the bad therapy is on this gentle parenting thing. Oh, dear Lord. And then James Lindsay's book that we looked at last week, The Queering of America. I think the American child. I think we need to lock in on those and try to understand what is happening right now to our kids and ask God, be asking God, show us what to do. Because I don't, we don't know. We don't know what to do. But God does, and so he'll show us if we ask him. All right, so on that note, let's pray. Let's pray here, let's just stand before the Lord real quick and we'll pray. Lord, we come before you and we ask you for help. You're not surprised by where we're at as a society, as a church. 
Lord, you have wisdom, and we're asking you, God, counsel us as families, as parents, grandparents, church leaders, business leaders, Lord, just having an impact even on society. Counsel us. Help us. Give us wisdom. And Lord, as we continue in the the scriptures today, open our minds to understand what you're speaking to us through the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. You can be seated. We've been studying the Beatitudes, and uh, what's so striking about Jesus' words is how contradictory they are to our Western world. Poor, meek, mourn, hunger, thirst, merciful, peace, pure, peacemakers, pure, persecuted. It's, it's all just not American. Even Christian Americans don't like this stuff. But Jesus says these are the virtues that will define my followers. The Beatitudes are like the Ten Commandments of the New Covenant. There, there's no pick and choose option. It's not, you know, thou shalt not murder, I'll take that one, pass on adultery, you know. In fact, Jesus even takes it further. He calls for purity of the heart and defines what it looks like. In verse 80, he, he's gonna tell us that it's the only way to see God, that it's the only way to be next to God, to be close to God, which makes this a massive problem for all of us. Somebody did a study using the 5.2 million books that are archived in Google to track the way we're using language these days, and the results were fascinating, not surprising. They looked at how many times words related to moral excellence and virtue were used in 20th century American books, and they found a huge decline in words like honesty, patience, humility, faithfulness, conscience, decency, virtue, and even love. They got replaced with self-focused words like unique, personalized self, and phrases like all about me, I'm special, I'm the best. The guys who did the research concluded in a broad cultural picture, individual achievement and fulfillment are valued above almost anything else, everything else. And that's why we're about to tank as a nation right now. The common good is a core value this country was built on. And right now, it's all about me. It's all about my stuff, my life. New York Times columnist David Brooks calls it a magnification of of the self. And us, an overconfident species. So how does a me-focused society continue to exist? It's a question I'm asking. We don't. Short answer, that's been the woke Marxist strategy in our schools, businesses, and media from the get-go to literally destroy Western society. In the very first beatitude, Jesus gets to the root of the problem, calling us broken, desperate sinners. And being poor in spirit means we become acutely aware of that fact, leading us to mourning our condition in the second. And if you missed either of those, I mean, please go back and listen to that, because those two messages are the basis of this whole sermon. And uh, they're online, and I mean, you're really gonna miss a big part of this if you don't understand that. Here's the third. Jesus tells us how that affects the way we relate to people in Matthew 5, 5. Let's read this together, all right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Poverty of spirit is the awareness of our lack before God. Meekness is our awareness, is the awareness of our lack before people. Today we're gonna talk about why being meek is such a good thing. Even though the word has almost lost most of its original meaning, I mean, we say a person's as meek as a what? As a mouse, yeah. Call somebody meek and they're most likely be offended. You know, it's like calling them a pushover. But the guy who was the premier example in the Old Testament was anything but a pushover. In his early years, Moses was so self-confident when he saw one of his countrymen being mistreated, he killed the perp and buried his body. He was out to save his people by himself. But then he spent several decades in the wilderness swapping self-confidence for God-confidence, and then in his 80s, he's ready for the Lord to use it. All that to say meekness doesn't come easy for any of us. I mean, but that's what it's gonna take to win this culture war we're in right now. If we're, if we're going to win in this thing, we're gonna have to look at Moses and realize that's what God's after, Jesus said it, In the video we saw last week, James Lindsay quoted Jesus in Matthew 10 saying, now more than ever, we wanna be as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. He said, 
when we're harsh and condescending, we just give the woke mob what they want. And I've seen examples of this, even in recent weeks, from people that surprised me. Uh, I watched Jordan Peterson, who's brilliant, you know, a self-disciplined guy, almost come over the table at an interviewer who couldn't seem to understand what had happened with the so-called COVID virus or vaccine. And what's, you know, I mean, he's trying to explain it to him, and, and the, the guy's totally not getting. What's interesting, even agnostics like he, him and Lindsay are acknowledging that we are up against something supernatural. The, the way people's minds have been altered and, and the blindness that they have to reality right now, you can call it gaslit, indoctrinated, brainwashed, but it's just way too real and global for humans to pull off. I mean, so, something of this magnitude requires an intellect outside our three dimensions. I mean, they're, they're, they're both acknowledging this is spiritual. I mean, they didn't believe in the devil till now because of what they're seeing. You used to be able to win arguments with reason, not anymore. With the indoctrination campaign that we've just gone through, things are different. I mean, we're dealing with something that we have never seen. Normal people have been sucked into a mind mill where they can't think rationally. They're, they're literally afraid to even listen to anything outside the reality they've been fed to believe. Have you found that to be true? I mean, you just can't even, you, you, they get scared when you start talking about things. No, I don't wanna know that. I don't wanna read, no, I'm not reading that. That's what Dr. Nels talks about in his book, The Indoctrinated Brain. He, he lays this out so clearly, the physiological change that takes place in our brain when we reach this level of propaganda. It literally changes our brain chemistry. Think of how much is coming at us right now with such rapidity and consistency. I mean, this is a, a planned out indoctrination campaign to get us accept, to, to accept a totally new normal where we won't have anything and we'll live in a little you know, hovel and we'll be happy because they're gonna feed us bugs. You know, it, it's, it's happening with the querying of our children that Lindsay writes about. And when we finally do wake up, it's just hard not to react in fear or anger. You know, we just, yeah, we wanna, we're angry that, you know, we've let ourselves be duped. Moses is just such a great example of how God transforms a guy from self-sufficiency to dependency, to humble dependency. In his latter years, Moses, <laughs> I mean, this is what he would typically do when people came against him. He would fall on his face and say, God, this is your battle. At one point, the ground opened up and swallowed his accusers. <laughs> I, <laughs> that'd be pretty interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, everybody's going, whoa, leave him alone, leave him alone. I think the reason we're not seeing God intervene more is we're trying to fight flesh with flesh. Way too often I catch myself trying to battle a CRT, DEI, trans, vaccine, deception with reason. You know, I, I'll lay awake at night having mental conversations with people who are indoctrinated and that I can't get through to, you know, that I just can't seem to help them. And, and I'm going over and over again in my mind. Meekness is all about trusting God with outcomes. And uh, I am a sinner when it comes to that. I mean, I, I struggle with it. I, I want everybody to believe. I want everybody to know I'm not a crazy conspiracy nut. I'm telling the truth. And then the Holy Spirit, you know, spots lights, you know, what's at the root of that, which is way too often, I wanna look good, you know, in this thing, but this is not about me. You know, Jesus intentionally taught in parables because he was not trying to convince everybody. <laughs> I mean, when you read through the Bible as the way we're doing it every year, yeah, it just nails you, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus recognized that only the people who have eyes to see and ears to hear can understand spiritual truth. And those are the people he went after. He didn't bother trying to go after people that just couldn't get it. I gotta get a better handle on that. Some of you wanna know how to pray for me? Here you go, right here. Pray that, you know, it would relieve so much of my frustration that Brun can trust God with outcomes, you know? 
Because I've had several of you say, you know your problem, right? It's, you're not trusting God with the outcome here. Yes, I know it's easy to say, but to do that. <laughs> so prayer would help. Helps me to see the big picture. Because ultimately, God's kingdom is advancing and Satan is raging. That's what's going on. And, and we're instruments that God, we're the instruments God is using to thwart the devil's plans. The apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 10, 3. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Boy, there's a lot there. We've been given powerful spiritual weapons, but they only work when we're seeing things clearly and we're acting out of meekness. That's the heart posture that keeps us trusting God in an attitude of humility. We're remembering the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I forget that. It's not personal. This is God's fight. This is God's fight. The word meekness means strength under control. It's translated from a Greek word referring to a wild horse that's been tamed. <laughs> that's, such a, that's such a great visual. It means we're controlled in the ways we react to difficult people and circumstances. So as I talk about this, <laughs> use that picture. You know, picture yourself as a wild horse who wants to cut loose and rip an accusing person to shreds. Or lie to escape looking like the jerk who just did what you did. Or buck against somebody who's stealing your spotlight or preventing you from looking richer and smarter, more spiritual, more right, more victimized, more anything than the other guy. Those are the wild horse emotions that lurk in every one of us. And meekness is the harness that reins in our inflated egos. In Matthew 24, 12, Jesus said, made this statement concerning the time just before his appearing. He said, this is what it's gonna look like in the culture. And because lawlessness will be increased, read it with me, the love of many will grow cold. I think that's the key to understanding where we're at right now, to understanding this war. Meekness is hard because we're living in a satanically, satanically agitated culture. And to combat it, we have to intensify our dependence on the Holy Spirit and go the other way. We have to dial down our conversations. We have to try to create peace. And what we want to do is get in the battle and just say, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you what I read. I'll tell you what I know. Resisting the pull to be selfish in this entitled culture is a challenge. I mean, we're being antagonized. They're, they're trying to pick a fight. We're, we've watched... You know, how that under the guise of systemic racism, the woke mob tried to justify ransacking a target and stealing stuff. The cities that went woke and defunded the police are now scrambling to rehire police. You know, guys, we have to obey the authorities or we'll have bedlam. The Bible says all authority comes from God. And to have a civil society, we have to have those who enforce the law. And again, the simple reason, and this is where the woke mob seems to miss it, is that people are not good. They're broken sinners, all of us. And I need God's help to even talk about this stuff in the right tone. Because I want to ramp up and shout at people. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I told Debbie, I said, it's really hard to preach a sermon that you need more than anybody else, you know? <laughs> I need a dose of meekness right now, you know? How about you? Man, good to know, all right. Makes me feel better. Comes down to stuff like this, all right, I'm gonna give you five things. Number one, another service we wanna be understanding. I don't need to tell you how hard that is. In fact, to be grateful and understanding without a Holy Spirit connection is gonna be impossible to maintain in, in the days ahead. The Bible says in Philippians 2, Three, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interest. Take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And if that's not difficult enough, in Matthew 5, 
48, Jesus takes it up a notch and said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And his disciples, I love this, look at him and go, well then who can be saved? <laughs> Nobody, that's his point. Apart from God, all of this is impossible. He's saying, saying, that's what God was hoping you'd get the first time around with the Ten Commandments. You need his help to do any of this stuff. Okay, so here's what that looks like. You go to a restaurant, you get a waiter who totally ignores you. You're thinking, he's waited on everybody but us. Or the salesperson who's surly, or the checker who seems to be going in reverse. It's like, how do I pick the wrong line every single time? You know, what is wrong with these people? It's that bucking horse in me. You know, it's that, I honestly believe the Holy Spirit sets me up. I don't know about you. I'm, I, I'm not kidding you. I can go to the line that has one person who's already practically paying the bill. The other line has five people in it. And something's wrong with their credit card. The manager gets called over. Five people are gone and I'm still standing. <laughs> and it's happened way too many times to be coincidence. And it's not the devil, because I've tried rebuking it. You know, it's, <laughs> I think it's the Holy Spirit, don't you? I think he's trying to teach me patience and I'm a slow learner. Well, how do you know that about me? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> God help us, right? Help all of us. I'm learning to harness that bucking ego by leaning in and breathing a trust connection prayer, you know? So it, it, literally, in that moment, that's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? So when I finally step up to the register, instead of being snarky and venting my frustration, I treat them with respect. And in the process, something begins to change in me. We're, we're really just practicing the golden rule Jesus gave us in Matthew 7, 12, which is also in the Sermon on the Mount. Re re read it with me. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. We get traction talking to God in the situation. Holy Spirit, help me, help me, help me. I wanna react here. Help me be gentle. Even though these people are paid to you know, keep this stuff from happening to me. Help me stop focusing on how I'm being inconvenienced and be understanding. So your grace and your love is what gets displayed here. Show me how to act in this situation. Even the fact that you're recognizing in this, this in yourself is proof the Holy Spirit's at work in you. When, when you pull back the reins of anger when somebody's mistreating you and ask Holy Spirit to give you a kind thing to say when you wanna be mean, that's huge. That's huge. Even recognizing when you blow it is a God thing. I say, Holy Spirit, I, I didn't do so well. You know, sorry about that. I, I didn't trust you on that one. And I, you know what I think he says? I think he said, but you recognized it. I'll help you next time. I hope you do better. Number two, when others mess up, we wanna be gentle. When people finally wake up and come around to what's happening, it's so hard to not be snarky, isn't it? To say, well, it's about time. I tried to tell you this stuff. For three years, I've been trying to get you to read books. And then you tell them what an idiot they were to believe the propaganda. You know, we've gotta be gracious with people who are just getting red-pilled. You know maybe still in the process right now. When I see Bill Maher starting to come around, I wanna bash him for what he's not seeing. You know, it's like, you're still, never mind. <laughs> but it really helps to stop and realize where I started. Because early on, from this pulpit, I suggested D'Angelo's book on a weekend. And then one of you <laughs> wrote me up. <laughs> A very straightforward letter, let's just put it that way. It said, what were you thinking? <laughs> and you know, I just heard somebody recommend the book. I didn't actually read it, you know, so it's like, oh dear. So when people mess up, which is inevitable, we wanna be gentle. Instead of saying, I'm, you know, sure saw that one coming, try praying the speech prayer, you know, in the fellowship list. You know, ask God to keep the door to your lips. What, you know, what is it about us that gets so much satisfaction out of other people's foul ups? It's that untamed bucking ego that loves the way their badness makes my goodness look good. <laughs> makes it shine, you know? The attitudes are, they're, they're all connected. Each one triggers the next. So if you recognize you're poor in spirit and it leaves you mourning, the consequence will be meekness. 
Well, you see how unjust it is for you to be self-righteous and demanding. Can you see that? Paul gives us a great description here in Galatians 6. He, he says, if someone is trapped in sin, you should gently lead that person back to the right path. But watch out and don't be tempted yourself. You obey the law of Christ when you offer each other a helping hand. Not when you say, well, look who's finally waking up. <laughs> you know, it's about time, sleepyhead. Paul says, no, don't do that. Help them recover with an attitude of gentleness. Don't be a smart aleck. The thing that angered Jesus more than anything was the self-righteous, judgmental attitude of the religious leaders. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't confront wokeness in the culture like they were. We just have to do it in a spirit of meekness. If we come at the opposition with the same self-righteous, judgmental attitude they're coming at us, we lose the battle. But here again, even recognizing this in ourselves indicates our hearts changing, the, that, and that's huge. I, I, I try to talk to the Holy Spirit about this a lot. Sometimes just help me, help me. If Jesus Christ, the God of angel armies, didn't act high and mighty, how do we get off thinking we can? I mean, we gotta put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Probably not long ago, we, you were just as oblivious, right? Keep praying that fellowship prayer list, you know? The prayer in the book that says, you know, help me learn lowliness of heart from you, Jesus. Because little by little, over time, he will transform you. None of these changes happen overnight. One small glimpse at a time, you'll start seeing this. Country singer John Rich tells a story about his dad showing amazing gentleness uh, with a hostile crowd. Let's listen to this. My dad went to 36 Mardi Gras in a row and stood there on the corner in the, French, in the French Quarter with a guitar around his neck, singing gospel songs and preaching. And there's one picture of my dad I saw where his guitar looked like it was wet or something. And I'm looking at this old picture. I said, what's that on your guitar? He goes, oh, that's spit. I said, you spit on your guitar? He goes, of course I didn't spit on my guitar. He said, I was singing. He said, the uh, gay pride parade came by. And they all took turns spitting all over me, spitting. And he said, they covered me head to toe and spit. And I said, you just stood there and took it and kept singing? He goes, yeah. I said, why did you do that? He goes, because about one out of 500 of them would stop and ask me what I was talking about and wanted to know what I was talking about. That Thank God I was around somebody like that as a, as a model to when you know you're supposed to go do something on behalf of the boss, you do it. Karis and Clayton, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I was not that bad. You know, man, oh man. That just convicts me of the core, does it you? Yes. Oh my goodness, I want to be that. Sermon on the Mount is God's standard. And it gives us, you know, and studying it gives the Holy Spirit something to bring to mind when we're in the situation. Eugene Peterson called Christianity a long obedience in the same direction. See, that's the value of studying this together. Now we know what to do. I mean, the Holy Spirit's there to help us, but we gotta know what to do, and now we know what to do. It's, it's called meekness, it's humility, you know. Here's another part, number three, we're, when others disagree, we wanna be kind. Kindness in the face of hostility, man, that's a standout, letting go of sarcasm, Sarcasm and all the cutting ways people talk to each other, that's a huge way we fight against having a, the cold heart Jesus was talking about. He said, you're gonna get a cold heart, you go that way. When someone disagrees with me, I try to be kind. Here's a universal fact of life. You can't please everybody. About the time you get one person happy with you, somebody else gets upset for the same reason. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. It's in the handbook for pastoral ministry. You're just gonna, you're not gonna please everybody. Disagreeable people are irritating and they provoke us to do one of three things, either retreat in fear, attack in anger, or respond in love. Again, meekness is not weakness. It's not being a passive doormat, allowing people to always have their way. That's codependence or cowardice. Proverbs 15, one, this is an excellent verse to memorize. Let's read it together. A kind answer soothes angry feelings, but harsh words stir them up. 
That's how you diffuse volatile situations and resist the urge to power up and talk down to people. You tune into Holy Spirit living in your born again spirit and you hand him the reins. You say, help me, I can't do this. I wanna react right now, help me calm down. And he will. He'll give you wisdom and insight not to react. Look at what James 3 says. For where envying, where envying strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The word for gentle there is the same as, as meek. It means strength under control, a gentle giant. Meekness is learning to disagree agreeably. It's being able to walk hand in hand without seeing eye to eye. And I think it's a major God thing that we are still doing that as a church, that we are still a family, because we have been pushed to the limit with all this stuff that has come at us, with critical race theory and all the issues associated with that. I mean, the left really tried to divide us on the melanin content in our skin. I'm telling you, some of you paid a high price to hang in there and walk in love, and I think heaven is applauding right now. I, I really do. I rem I, I'm, I'm amazed at what God has done here. We, we have remained a multicultural church. Maybe that's not the right word, ethnic, whatever, while confronting the culture. I mean, we have not backed away at all, and yet God has held us together. And that's, that's a miracle, don't you think? That's a miracle. When people, okay, so when people disagree, you can either be passive, always let them have their way, fight them tooth and nail, get angry, blow up, and be sarcastic, or you can respond in love with the general answer. Sarcasm is by far the most popular. You know, we love sarcastic humor in our culture. And why wouldn't we? I mean, we get to vent, look clever, and make people laugh all at the same time. But we fail to realize how it's messing us up. It, it, the, the culture may adore us, but it's upside down to the way we've been wired spiritually. It's upside down to the way God's kingdom works. When we get into sarcasm, sarcasm, Holy Spirit says, I can't connect with you in this mode. Drop the cool and be genuine. So I say, okay, I surrender this too. <laughs> I surrender the, my reputation as the funny guy. God, I want your approval more than I want theirs. I don't want anything blocking my connection with you. I'm telling you, you start praying like that and you'll sense the Holy Spirit nudge you to stop mid-sentence when you had such a good punchline. <laughs> You're thinking, Lord, you are killing me. And the Holy Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit immediately said, yes, I am. Yes, I am. This is what it means to take up your cross. This is how you maintain a vibrant spirit and feel really alive. Let go of being popular and embrace meekness. Jesus says, blessed, favored by God to be congratulated are the meek who treat others the way God treats them with kindness. Number four, when others correct us, we wanna be teachable. Again, this is hard right now in this environment. We have to stay open to the idea that we may not have all the facts, that we may not see things clearly. We're in information overload. Most of our fact checking is a joke. Google, the biggest fact checking machine of all time, has admitted that they made up a ton of their facts to suit their worldview. Just made them up. So we've gotta pull out of this arrogant, unteachable, know-it-all attitude of superiority. I hope we don't get knocked off YouTube for that. They've done it multiple times. I think humility and teachableness sets us up for God to bless us more than anything else. When, when somebody corrects us, meek people are eager to learn. They don't pretend they know it all. Here's the New Testament interpretation. James 1.19 says, read this with me. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. If you get the first two right, you get the third automatically. It's like you get the third for free. If you're quick to listen, slow to speak, you'll be slow to anger. It just comes with the territory. He's saying, really try to listen. Stay open. Meek people aren't know-it-alls. In fact, they don't even, you don't even want to hang out with people who are like that. They're dangerous. We've known a lot in recent years. God sets up his kingdom to operate on the basis of spiritual gifts, so we all have something to contribute. He didn't give one person all knowledge or all wisdom, and that's why this prophetic 
prophetic thing we're in right now. You know, with all these guys that have the inside track, watch out. Just watch out. Proverbs 11 says, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there's safety. God put us together because he gives us wisdom corporately. You can't go it alone. You will lose all objectivity. We're in the danger zone right now. You need a small group of people who can speak truth into your life, help you stay objective and account- accountable. I see people you know, just saying, I don't need the church. Yes, you do. Where do you read that in the Bible? So here's the way to pray. You know, God, bring people into my life to speak to me, even if I don't like them. Help me to listen. Help me stay open and remain teachable. And get ready, because he will <laughs> use people that you think, really? Really? Did you have to use them, Lord? I mean, God's getting us out of all this stuff that's blocking the flow of his grace. I can't tell you over the years how, how many people that God has used that I just didn't like. <laughs> it's so much better, though, when you can wake up in the morning, you have clarity, and your spirit's clean, your soul's connected. All right, finally, I knew I'd get here. When others hurt us, we want to be forgiving. Now, I don't think there is anything more counterculture than this one. Uh, same was true in Jesus' day. To quickly forgive an offense, that's a whole new way of behaving and thinking. It reminds me of the truck driver who was sitting in a diner just minding his own business and some tough looking guys walk in. One of them elbowed him as he passed, spilling his coffee and, and uh, then he threw his hip into the ledge of the table, knocking his bowl of chili into his lap. And they, you know, all had a good laugh. The truck driver just, you know, got up calmly, paid his bill and left. A troublemaker called out to the waitress, not much of a man, is he? Waitress said, not much of a truck driver either. He just ran his semi over all your motorcycles on the way out of here. <laughs> You know why we're laughing, right? <laughs> Payback, baby. That's our immediate reaction. It's what makes blockbuster movies. But here's the thing, if we want a vibrant spirit, that thing has to die. We have to give up this revenge-loving, get-even, bucking bronco. This is a great verse to memorize, Romans 12, 17. Let's read it together. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. That's meekness. And if you're not connecting with the Holy Spirit, it's not gonna happen. Responding with forgiveness when we're hurt is basically handing God the reins. I mean, that takes God. The great scientist Booker T. Washington faced tremendous prejudice all his life. And he said, I will never allow another man to control or ruin my life by making me hate him. What a powerful statement. When you say, when you say this to people, you make me mad, you're actually admitting someone else controls your emotions. In fact, you're informing them that you have the ability to dominate me. The moment you go into retaliation, get in even mode, you're giving up control because you're no longer acting, you're reacting. It's a position of weakness. And again, Moses, great example. We just read this this week in our Bible reading. If you're following with us in this, please do. He's being criticized for marrying a dark-skinned woman in, in number 12, and this time it's his brother Aaron's sister Miriam. And once again, Moses doesn't argue with him. He just lets God settle the matter, and God says, okay, Miriam, you like white skin. How about a lot of it? Verse 10, there stood Miriam with her skin as white as snow from leprosy. Now, that would have been a great time for Moses to gloat and say, Ha-ha. City begs God for mercy, healing. That's meekness. It's handling hurt without retaliation. Best definition is Proverbs 16. Let's read this one together. It's verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his own spirit than he who takes a city. When, when people attack us, our emotions just naturally flare up. We, we want to say all kinds of stuff we haven't thought through. <laughs> Right? Holy Spirit says, slow down, slow down. You're in no position to act. We just read that verse. Ruling your spirit's far better nuking your enemy. Use all that negative energy to fill your sail and push you to God. Talk to him right now. Say, God, I'm really wanting to react. I've got good ammunition too. Help me not to use it. And he will. He will. He'll settle you down. All right, so I want us to see 
one of the greatest forgiveness stories that I've seen, all right? Watch this. Jamel McGee says he was minding his own business when a police officer accused him of and arrested him for dealing drugs. You saying the officer made it up? Yeah, it was all made up. Of course, a lot of accused men make that claim, but not many arresting officers agree. So you phonied the report? I did, I, I falsified the report. This is former Benton Harbor police officer, Andrew Collins. Were you just trying to chalk up an arrest? Well, basically, the start of that day, I was gonna make sure I had another drug arrest. And in the end, you put an innocent guy in jail? Correct. Yeah. You lost everything. I lost everything. My only goal was to seek him when I got home and to hurt him. Really? That was my goal. Eventually, that crooked cop was caught, served a year and a half for falsifying many police reports, planting drugs and stealing. Of course, Jamel was exonerated, but he still spent four years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Today, both men are back here in Benton Harbor, which is a small town, maybe a little too small. Hey guys, thank you. Last year, by sheer coincidence, they both ended up at Mosaic, a faith-based employment agency where they now work side by side in the same cafe. Oh, excuse me. And it was in these cramped quarters that the bad cop and the wrongfully accused had no choice but to have it out. And I said, honestly, I have no explanation. All I can do is say I'm sorry. And Jamel says that was all it took. That was pretty much what I needed to hear. Today, they're not only cordial. So Saturday, we went to the trampoline park. They're friends. Uh, you know, we talk about life. Such close friends. Not long ago, Jamel actually told Andrew he loved him. And I just started weeping because he doesn't owe me that. Uh, he, I don't deserve that, you know? Did you forgive for his sake or for yours? No, for our sake. Not just us, for our sake. Jamel went on to tell me about his Christian faith and his hope for a kinder <laughs> mankind. He wants to be an example. So now he and Andrew give speeches together about the importance of forgiveness and redemption. I'll grab this one, set it over there. And clearly, if these two guys from the coffee shop can set aside their bitter grounds, what's our excuse? That, that takes my breath away every time I watch it. I watched a bunch of Christian videos of people forgiving each other, but wow. And you get, they're actually teaching, to, I mean, they're giving talks together. That's, that's how we make a difference in a world that we're in right now. If you haven't taken our 70 times seven forgiveness class, I really recommend that, it starts this week. Giving up our rights, taking up our cross, that's a daily commitment, and we get better with practice but it's so worth it. Look at what Jesus said. I want, I want to end with this because this is, this is motivation. Blessed are the meek, read the rest with me, for they shall inherit the earth. When Jesus talked about the age to come where he's gonna be ruling from Jerusalem, he made it clear that eternal rewards would play a huge role in what we would be doing with him. And I think he's telling us that the meek are gonna be at the top tier of his leadership team. Moses was the goat. I mean, in the Old Testament, he was the goat leader. I mean, he, the meekness was his number one characteristic. As believers in Christ, this is how the new creation in our born again spirit wants to express itself. If we'll stay connected, Holy Spirit will help us. All right, let's stand. Some of you didn't think this would ever end. Uh, I just wanted to cover this, because, I, man, I think this is a big one, don't you? I, and did, did you notice that when I was talking about this, even though it was just like hitting you in the face, and you're going, oh, I don't do well on that one. Something inside you was going, yes. Yes, I want that. You know what that is? That's your born again spirit. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. Saying, I want, the, I want everything for you. I want you to be at the top tier of Jesus' leadership team. I want, you to, I want you to inherit the earth. I want you to get this right. So Lord, help us, all right? Holy Spirit, 
I lay down my rights to get even and hold grudges even when everything says I'm justified and I have the right. Forgive me for holding on to offenses. Rise up in me, strengthen me with might, my inner man. This is the way I pray these things. I want your meekness, your love flowing through me, reflecting your image in me. Can't do this without you. All right, this song just helps us get there. All right, let's sing a verse of it and we'll conclude here. God, I look to you. to be born again. This, these are Jesus' words. He said, you have to be born again for any of this to make sense. The reason Christianity has never made sense to you is your spirit's dead. You've got a dead spirit and only Jesus can resurrect it. And it can happen right here before you leave here. Just in a simple prayer. You don't, you know, we're not going to lock you into some kind of, you know, cult covenant. This is, this is, this is just about receiving forgiveness, receiving what God wants to do. So, soft ending here. They're gonna sing through this one more time. We're all gonna sing through it one more time. And then, after that's done, those of you who are parents, please go get your kids first. And the rest of you, you're free to stay or to go. But let's just keep this a place of, of prayer, because there are a lot of people coming forward here that want prayer, all right? One more time. God, I look to you. 